All right, so we're going to jump into indoor soccer rules. Um, we'll get through some of this. We'll take a break in a little bit. Um, but feel free to stop me if you have any questions. Um, this goes a lot better if it's interactive and engaging. We've got some videos that we'll show uh, to kind of highlight some of the things we're going to talk about. Um, and, and hopefully uh, this, this won't be too painful for you all. Um, so our check-in procedure. What, what do we need if you're coming into the rec center? How do you get into the building? Exactly. And we play all of our indoor soccer games on um, Matt Court 5 and 6. So anybody that's coming to play should have their student ID with them. So hopefully that's super easy. Um, to check in, they're going to have to have their UNCW ID in one card. Um, you won't have to deal with this a lot as officials. Our supervisors and our sport assistants should handle most of the check-ins, but if something gets swamped, they might ask you, hey, can you check their one card for me? Just make sure it's them. Uh, so you can just kind of take it, look at their face, make sure that it matches the picture on the one card, and we can check them in. Um, so they'll check in outside the MAC gym. We'll have a table set up for them. It'll have all the jerseys set up on it. Um, so the person that's doing the sign-ins, they'll, they'll take their one card, sign them in, they'll sign the waiver, and we'll hand them a jersey. They'll be good to go. Um, Make sure the part that's going to be most pertinent to you is making sure the players are taking their jewelry off, especially in a sport like indoor soccer. Um, so in soccer, uh, the, the ball is going to be flying everywhere inside there. There is the, the, most of the out of bounds is high, so the, the ball is going to be every, everywhere's in bounds. Um, so making sure we're checking for players for jewelry is going to be really important. Uh, you don't want an earring to get past you and then they get hit in the ear and the stud goes into the side of their head. Um, we don't want somebody's finger to get caught in a necklace when they're jumping for a header or something. So just things like that um, are things that can happen with jewelry that a lot of people don't think about and we want to catch in intramurals. Um, so staying with the safety theme, illegal, illegal equipment um, in indoor soccer, um, no hats. Uh, the hard bill, if the, anybody lands on the hard bill, that's going to do damage uh, to, to, their, to their head. Um, so, so we take those out. Um, and they must have closed-toed shoes. Uh, it, it seems natural. Um, but uh, if they have open, open shoes, that's a recipe for a broken toe or something. Uh, so just making sure that everybody's properly equipped before we start the game uh, will help your games go a lot smoother as officials. Uh, we'll provide the game balls for the teams. Uh, we strongly recommend shin guards, but a lot of people don't wear them, um, so they don't have to have them. Um, but they do have to be wearing athletic attire. Um, so they can't be wearing marking shoes, sandals, etc. They have to be dressed to actually partake in physical activity. Um, so you'll start off each game with a captain's meeting. Uh, Jude, do you want to tell me what happens in a captain's meeting? Okay. Uh, in a captain's meeting, you pretty much kind of explain the basic rules, like timing, substitution, stuff like that. Also remind them about the jewelry, and uh, just kind of explain the basic rules and get to know them, introduce yourself, stuff like that. Yeah, so it's your opportunity to first interact with the with the captains of the team. So you kind of get to set that set that standard that you're expecting out of your teams early, and you also get to make a friend. We say make a friend early. Um, so that's kind of the person you can go to uh, later in the game and hopefully help calm down their teams if things if things are getting out of control. Um, so so make sure you're doing your captains meeting and you're and you're doing a thorough job introducing yourself and talking about what your expectations are for the game. Um, so for soccer. Uh, they, we, we're fortunate that we don't have a lot of choices after the coin toss. There's two things they can choose. They're either going to choose the ball or they're going to choose which side they want to be on. Most of the time the teams are going to choose the ball, uh, but if you get a 6 o'clock game, somebody might be like, you know, the sun's coming through that window and we don't like it, even though we could just close the blinds for them, and they might choose to go a different way. Um, but most of the time it'll be the ball that they want. Um, and then in the second half, we're just going to flip it. So whoever got the ball in the first half doesn't get in the second half, and they're going to flip sides. Um, so it's, it's pretty simple for, for in soccer as far as how we start each half. Um, indoor soccer, we're going to play five on five. One of them is the goalkeeper, so that means four on the court actually running around, and then the goalkeeper. Um, and if they are uh, playing short, they don't have their entire team there at the start, they can start with a minimum of four. Um, but uh, again, one of those would probably be a goalkeeper, but we're not going to force them to have a goalkeeper at that point. Um, timing wise, so our game consists of two 20 minute halves, the five minute half time, and the time, the time runs continuously. Um, the only exception would be if we have an injury or something that we have to stop it to take care of, but other than that we're going to run the clock continuously throughout the game. Um, if we get in a situation where we have overtime, it's a three minute sudden death uh, game. 
Sudden death meaning first goal wins the game. Um, if they're still tied, then we'll go to a five player shootout like you might be familiar with in traditional soccer if anybody's played or officiated it before. Um, it's not going to happen a lot, but it will happen a couple times. Uh, we don't end the game in a tie. Uh, we always want to have a winner. So um, if you remember anything from this training, remember that we're sending them home at the end of the night with a winning team. Uh, don't send anybody, anybody away with a tie. Um, your mercy rule, 20 goals or more with five minutes or less remaining, 10 goals or more with two minutes or less remaining. Um, th those numbers are um, seem kind of high, but you might see those uh, mercy rules, especially in indoor soccer. It's really fast and the scoring really picks up really fast. So, um, all right, does anybody have any questions about those? Okay, we're gonna break into crews. We got three iPads. Um, so we're gonna number off starting down. So our first one, subbing on the fly, group one, what did you guys say for this? Substitutions comes off the clock. You just kind of sub the run of the play. Yep. Um, you have anything else with it? But as to be during the whole period, it's like no. No. Anybody else have anything with subbing on the fly that they want to add to what they said? They said during the run of play, which is how we do it. Graham. You gotta be within like five yards of the door. Yeah, we like to make sure they're kind of close. Uh, that way they're not just running out and they've got too many people out there before somebody realizes they're being subbed off. Um, so they can sub for any time for any player. Um, the exception is the goalkeeper. Uh, just because the goalkeeper's in the goal, we like to keep that one during a dead ball. That way they can't be running their goalkeeper off and then complain that they get scored on because their goalkeeper's at half court. Um, so the player who's coming off must exit the playing surface before the player coming on may enter the court. We have it worded that they have to exit, but as long as they're close, let them go. Um, just we don't want them to start getting too many people on the court playing at, the, at one time. Um, and it, if done incorrectly, so if you stop it because they sub incorrectly or improperly, then it's an indirect kick for the offended team. Any questions? Cool. Um, so this should be an example of the door needing to be shut. Um, so yeah, it's the one down there. So just make sure after people come into the court that we get the doors closed so that doesn't happen. Uh, there is metal on those doors and sharp edges, so if somebody flies into an open one, there's a chance that they're gonna get hurt, so we just wanna make sure those stay closed. Um, and then this is um, them subbing up there. Um, so, the, the player coming off knows they're coming off, they're coming to the door. Uh, they're pretty close when the player goes on, so that's all, that's fine. Uh, they didn't do anything wrong there. Uh, this one is incorrectly done, so you'll see the player come on. He's just kind of all the way out there. Now granted, this is a dead ball, so it didn't disrupt anything, but just to give you an example of how we don't want players going out on the court with too many people out there. So um, this one, maybe just talk to them and say, hey, can we make sure our subs are closer to the door before we come on because they didn't actually interrupt play or anything. All right, goalkeeper restrictions, group two. What'd you all say? Um, you cannot grab the ball outside of your box. Okay, yep. And when a teammate gives you the ball, you can yeah, so when it's intentionally played back to you from the from the feet. Yeah. Um, okay, anything else? Anybody else have anything that's unique to intramurals? Can't punt it. Can't punt it, yep, can't punt. Can't throw it past half. Can't throw it past half. Anything else? Slide. Can't slide. Um, within reason. Um, I think that's... I've got five fingers and that's five bullet points, so we're going to assume that's all of them. Um, so, so they can use their, their, his or her hands inside the penalty area, which is, you mentioned. Um, so for indoor soccer, that's defined as the solid handball arc that's on the court. Um, so we'll use that as kind of our, our box for the keeper. Um, they, they cannot pick a ball that's played back from the foot of his or her teammate. So um, same as outdoor soccer, we kind of keep that consistent in indoor. Uh, they have six seconds to play the ball uh, once they've picked it up with their hands. Now this is a very lenient six seconds. If you've ever played soccer, you know that sometimes referees count seven, eight, uh, before they start getting on the referee to get rid of the ball. Um, but if they're really trying to delay the game by holding the ball, then that's when we want to start pressuring them to get rid of the ball within their allotted time. Um, 
the goalkeeper can't punt or drop kick the ball. Uh, they, if they want to play the ball with their feet, it's got to be from the ground um, for indoor soccer. Um, and then the ball may not be thrown over midcourt in the air. Um, but if they roll it or it bounces before midcourt or hits another surface before going over midcourt, then that's a legal uh, distribution of the ball. Um, and then uh, they cannot slide. Um, none of our players can slide, and we'll cover sliding more later on. Um, but that's, that rule also applies to the goalkeepers. So, Some videos of goalkeepers. Uh, she threw it um, way past half court and it hits the player. And as soon as it hits that player, that's where it's dead. Um, so then it'll get restarted from midcourt for the other team. Um, she's got to make sure that that hits the ground, the player, or the wall before it goes across midcourt. Um, so this is the goalkeeper going to ground to get the ball. Uh, she doesn't do anything wrong there. She didn't slide towards the player. She just kind of went down to the ground and covered it up. So that's all right. Um, I think she's still within her restricted arc. I can't tell from this angle. Um, so it looks like she did everything well there. Um, she, didn't, she didn't put any players in danger or anything, even though that one player kind of stumbles over her. Um, that wasn't really her doing. Um, Okay, any questions about goalkeeper restrictions? Cool. Free kicks, you guys. Uh, in all free kicks are indirect kicks. Okay. And basically, it's just whenever there's a foul at penalty and it's not an advantage, you call a free kick. Okay. Cool. So some intricacies into the all free kicks are indirect kicks. Like you said, any foul. Um, is going to be a free kick, and also any out of bounds is a free kick for our indoor soccer game. Um, so uh, we don't have throw-ins for indoor soccer, so everything will be restarted from a kick. Um, so with indirect free kicks, signal an indirect free kick by putting your arm straight up in the air. This way, everybody on the court knows it's an indirect kick, and it's got to touch somebody or, or somebody else before it can be scored. Um, so exactly what it says. Must touch another player before a goal can be scored. Uh, defensive players have to be at least 10 feet from the ball at the time it's played. Different from outdoor, much smaller court, so it's a smaller space. It's only 10 feet, not 10 yards. Um, the only exception uh, to our indirect free kick rule is if there's a penalty kick. So if a player gets fouled in the restricted area or the goalkeeper create or, uh, or the goalkeeper fouls somebody inside the inside their box. Um, We'll do a penalty kick just like outdoors. Um, we're still using the handball lines though, so we'll play from the three foot line uh, just past the penalty area. And then there's a dashed line that's further out. Uh, that'll be our containing arc for our players. Everybody will have to be behind that except for the goalkeeper and the kicker. Okay, any questions? What happens if they take a free kick and shoot it and score? Like, is it just free kick for the other team? Though? Um, so if nobody touches it, and so if your goalie's smart, they'll try to not block it and just let it go into the goal. It'll be a goal kick for the for the defending team, just as if it had gone out over the end line. Okay, but if the keeper like tries to save it and taps it in, that's a goal. Save. And it's a goal. Yep. Yeah, it doesn't have to touch a teammate. It just has to touch a player. Um, so, so yeah, the goalie can get scored on by playing that ball. Um, so this kind of shows our court with uh, your solid arc, which is your goalie's restricted area, uh, your three-foot line, which is right here. That's where the penalty kick will be taken from. And then the dash line, that's our restricted line for the players to be behind during penalty kicks. All right, any questions about that? Cool. Um, so some of the free kicks that you'll have, um, to, that, you deal, that you'll have to deal with, um, any of your INGs, um, as we talk about in officials training for high school. Um, so kicking, tripping, jumping or charging, uh, checking, striking, tackling, pushing, handling, holding. Obstruction isn't an ING, but it's in there for outdoor soccer or for indoor soccer. Um, too many players on the court and any cards that you administer that aren't a result of a foul. So any kind of uh, just uh, sportsmanship cards or any or, um, administrative cards. All right, so who wants to tell me what they see wrong with this play? It's not playing the ball. Not playing the ball? What, what foul specifically is it? Push? Yeah, definitely pushing. Um, you can see he kind of lunges. He's, he disrupts the player's movement. 
Um, anytime you see a player jerk like that, it's a pretty good indication that there was a push. Not always, but most of the time. Um, so you're looking at the player's balance to see where, when and where it gets thrown off and how. Um, so in this one, the yellow player comes in and just kind of takes them out a little bit. This one's pretty clear. <laughs> and the best one is he knows he did it, too, because you, you see him. A lot of times, players will give themselves away. Um, but that's one of the ones where he knows he got caught, and he's going to go check on the other player, help him up. Um, but yeah, that one's tripping. Um, they all won't be that clear, but it's nice when you get an easy one like that. Um, <laughs> uh, what, what are we going with here? Tackling. tackling. Uh, fo American football tackling. Um, so the, the video says hip check. I'll go with a push. I'll go with a, a, a shove, wh whatever you want to go with. Um, they, at the end of the day, you don't have to report fouls like basketball, so you just have to blow your whistle when you see something wrong. Um, so you don't have to tell them what, what it is. Um, but it's definitely way more contact than there should be, and he got sandwiched from two sides. So uh, I'll, I'll give him a kick there. Did someone say he got ball? Well, that's the first guy. That was the ball about the second. Okay, I was gonna say because because <laughs> I'm like. No, the first guy. Yeah, the first guy got ball. The second guy cleared him out, though. So, <laughs> it just, it, so that's one of the things about soccer. Yes, you hit the ball. Um, that doesn't mean you didn't commit a foul, though. Um, just because you get the ball doesn't mean you can then go through and wipe out the player after the ball is gone. Um, so that's something you have to be aware of. It's a, it's a lot like um, a block shot in basketball for anybody that's officiated basketball. They might be clean up top with their block, but their body comes into them down low. It's still a foul. All right. Um, this is obstruction, which is one of our more intricate rules in soccer. Um, something you will see a lot, but probably won't call a lot. Um, so anybody want to explain to me what's going on here and why it's obstruction? He blocked him out. Did he make any attempt to play the ball initially? Or was he playing the player? Okay. Uh, so if you watch the yellow player right here, he found where the blue player was and then just rides him instead of going to the ball. So there's a difference between shielding the ball and obstruction. You can shield the ball as long as you're playing the ball and you're keeping somebody on your back, that's fine. It's when you look over and you find the player and then you play them and then you find the ball and go get it. That's obstruction. Um, so we want to make sure we're getting an obstruction. Um, you don't have to worry about it being an indirect kick or anything in indoor soccer because it, everything's indirect. Um, so um, we want to make sure we get that um, as much as possible. Um, it does happen a lot, but it's very rarely called. Um, but this is just an, a video we happen to get, and it's a good example of it. This one's fun. Okay, so he, he's kind of upset. He felt like he was fouled. So then he does this. <laughs> so uh, so uh, we, we think that was clean. Good 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 soccer play there. You think it's a yellow card? I don't know that. that might we'll, we'll come back to this play later on when we're talking about cards. But th this is a. Uh, so, so I don't often get to talk about charging other than it's actually a foul in soccer because usually charging is very violent activity. Um, this is charging. He goes straight through the player's back intentionally. Um, so. This is a, a video that will probably never get taken out of training, just because you don't see charging a lot, and so when you do, you gotta you gotta use it a lot. But um, you just consider the first one tripping though as well. Um, I actually don't think I had a. It doesn't look like he hits the ball. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I don't think I had tripping on the first one. I'll watch it again. No, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. That's it. But I'm, I'm definitely not okay with that one. <laughs> all right, so um, out of play. Was this one of the terms that you all? All right, what's out of play? Is it anything above the first tier line or the second? Depends. What's <laughs> <laughs> it first? Because that's where like, the bat starts. Okay, if it hits the wall, which one do you think it is? So it goes up in the air, makes contact with the wall. Where's it got to be to be out of bounds? 
above yeah. the second two lines? Above the first one. So if it hits the wall, if it's above the first teal line, out of play. So anything yellow? Anything in the yellow, but the yellow doesn't go around the entire court, so we say above the first teal line. Um, there's also nets, so any soft surface is out of play. Uh, so this divider here, in between the courts, out of play. You'll notice that it lines up very well with the first teal line. That's why we use that standard. Um, the nets that are in front of the scoreboards on both ends of the court, out of play. Uh, the nets in front of the team boxes, out of play. Um, now the second teal line, does come into play. If it doesn't hit the wall, if it's just... If it's straight up in the air, and it goes high enough to go above that second teal line up there, then we're going to call it dead, and wherever it's dead, we're going to pull it out to the side, and the team will get to restart from there, whichever team didn't play it up in the air. Um, so we do have a height limit as to how high our ball can go, and that's the second teal line. You might see it, might not, but um, that's typically when we're, when we're down on the court, we'll talk about this more. Typically, whoever's on this side is going to have to call that because they can see the teal line. There's no teal line for the person over there looking this way. Um, so whoever's against the team box isn't, isn't necessarily going to be able to see that. So that's where their partner's going to have to help them out from that side there. If it hits the line, it's in play. Yep. Just like outdoor soccer, if it stays on the line, you're in. Yep. Any other questions? Cool. Uh, so video this. One, this ball definitely goes too high, but um, then it jumps up into that soft meshing divider there. Um, so too high first, then it's in the divider, so we got out of bounds. I think that's Jenny that's officiating. Her hand goes up for an indirect kick. And then we start from there. Notice she doesn't step in to administer it. The team's ready to go, so they put it down quick. She lets them play. She just puts her hand up for the indirect kick. Once it's touched, she'll take it down. We don't have to set everything up for the teams. If they want to go fast, we can let them go fast. This is another one. Hits off the wall. So we should stop it. Yeah, we stopped it. So it hits the wall. We stopped it. And then they'll get a kick from right there, wherever uh, that ball is. Any questions about out of bounds? It's pretty straightforward. Oh, we have one more video. Sorry. It's in the net. So those nets are there. They keep our uh, keep our players on the benches safe. Um, and then whenever it hits the net, we have to restart from a from an out of bounds. Um, and just notice wherever it's out of bounds, we just put it right there in front of it, and we just play from there. Try to, try to get them to stop the ball. It doesn't stop easily on the hardwood, so it will kind of roll a little bit, but um, make an effort to have them stop the ball from rolling. Slide tackling, we just did you guys over here. It's not allowed. Not allowed. We talked about this. <laughs> um, what, what do you think the penalty is if, if you do slide tackle? If it's in the box, it's about as much. Well, if it's in the box, we'll do a penalty kick. Anywhere else, it's an indirect free kick. Um, what, what's, the, what's the repercussion? What's the consequence if you slide tackle? Yellow. Yellow? Can it be a red? Yeah, if it's too much. OK. Anybody else? If it's from behind, it's an immediate red. If it's with contact, it's an immediate red. If it's from the side or the front without contact, it's a yellow. I like all three of those. You got more? Yeah. All right. So slide tackling. Automatically, if you're calling a slide tackle, you're going to a pocket for a yellow card. Um, any player who slides without contact is going to get a yellow card for that. I don't know why people want to slide on the hardwood floors in the MAC gym. I don't want to, but for some reason, every season, we get at least a handful who are really persistent that they should be allowed to do it. Um, automatic red card for any player who slides and makes contact or slides from behind. Um, so. We, the biggest thing is intramurals, not everybody's on the same skill level. Not everybody's been playing competitive soccer their entire life. We want to keep people safe. Not everybody knows how to avoid a slide tackle. So in order to take that out of our game, we just go with this automatic yellow for no contact, automatic red for contact or from behind. Um, goalkeeper has the same restrictions as any player on the court. The only difference is the goalkeepers are allowed to dive side to side to block the ball. They, we, we allow them to be a goalie in that aspect but they can't run forward and try to take the ball off somebody's feet or slide into somebody to, to make a save. Um, but they can dive side to side to make a save. Anybody have any questions about that? You'll see it a lot. Is sliding for the goalie like with their feet first or hand first? 
So we just do it based off of momentum. So if your momentum is bringing you forward towards a player, then we're counting it as a slide. Um, we don't get into the judgment of, sleet or, of, of feet or, um, or hands first, just whichever way their momentum is taking them. Okay. Anything else? You'll see this a lot. You get a lot of questions about it, so just be prepared for it. Um, but it, it is one of the more important things that we have to enforce. Um, so this is a slide tackle. Like I said, we get a handful. <laughs> Uh, so the video clip we showed you with the player who charged through the other player, this is the same game, same team. <laughs> so I, I think that one's pretty self-explanatory. Um, so then play against the boards. What, what did you all have for that? Or the walls, I guess, in there. Is that like can't do? Yeah, so, so what, what can you do, what can't you do when you've got, when you've got the ball against the boards? Pass it off the boards okay. yourself or another teammate. Yep. Uh, I guess that's like the only can. I guess. Mm. Um, if I mean, it's not illegal, then you can basically do anything. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what can't we do? Uh, too aggressive, like play on. So like board checking. On defense. Yeah. So so no board checking. Like, yeah. Anything else? Can I just stick the ball up into the board and hold it there? Just to waste time? No. All right. So I can't freeze the ball against the boards. Um, so those are the two big ones with board, with board play that we, we talk about. Um, so any player who checks another player into the board, so think hockey, um, will be given an automatic yellow card. If it's determined to be with intent to harm, which we'll see later, um, a red card can be given. Um, so that's the first one kind of think of it very much like slide tackling. This is very aggressive and very likely will hurt somebody, so we nip it really fast. Um, if a player freezes the ball against the boards, a free kick will be awarded to the opposing team. Why do we not allow them to freeze the ball against the boards? It's kind of like asking for a foul. It's asking for a foul. If I'm standing here and I've got the ball frozen against this board, my back is to everybody else and somebody's going to get upset that I'm just wasting their time, they're just going to plow me into the board. So we take away the first one by calling the second. All right? So just kind of a, a preventative thing for, for, the, for the players. Any questions about the boards and how we administer? This one's not bad, I promise. Um, anybody see anything wrong with anything that happened here? Yellow is not really good. Do what? Who, who is? The yellow, yellow player. Okay. Okay. He was keeping the ball when he was in the ground. Yeah, so we'll talk about that, but he did play the ball when he, once he was on the ground. I think she already blew her whistle, though. If I had sound on, I could tell you, but did you guys have something? It's more on obstruction. It's more on obstruction? Yeah. I, I don't know if I'd really give obstruction here. They're both right there at the ball. Um, Green, Green's watching the ball, but he's not really putting his body into the yellow player, so he's not obstructing him. Yellow's coming in to make a play on the ball. Um, I don't have a whole lot of much here. Um, if anything, yellow probably made contact and fouled green trying to get that ball, but I definitely don't have a board foul. Um, the only thing you want to be careful of is that is a cinder block wall right there. So that is not the boards that give a little bit. That's a wall that's not going to move. Um, so you want to kind of step in quickly if players start to go down at that wall just to make sure everybody gets up and doesn't get pushed or whatever into the wall. Um, so I think that's what she was doing there, some preventative officiating, just get everybody up and then can restart from a kick. Are you allowed to play the ball on the ground? No, we'll talk about that. You are not. Um, so you have to get up before you can play the ball if you've gone to the ground. Uh, so kind of the same thing, a little bit. Um, <laughs> the reactions are always the best. So he, he kind of wedges him up in, into the wall there. Uh, that might be one where, you, where you, you're, you're going to your whistle and just and, and, and sending that one out. Um, 
he'll probably they'll, the players will probably look at you with that exact expression if you call that on them because they're going to feel like they were just shielding the ball or whatever. But he wedged them into the wall, and we don't allow them to do that. I'm not giving a yellow card for this one, though. That was not intentional or, well, it was intentional, but it wasn't with an intent or really a, a play that was using the, the boards of the wall maliciously. That was just him trying to make himself large and, and hold the ball. Um, so, so I don't think that's a yellow card. Any questions about that one? Who would you give the ball to? No, the green player. Yeah, because yellow is the one who pinches him into the, board, into the wall. So I give it to green. All right, so this one happens fast right there. What do you think about that one? Push them against the boards. Anybody else? Yeah, I mean, you can see it happen. It's not, as, it's not super egregious, but he did push him against the board. It's probably more of a push than a board check, but um, it, it is play against the board that you need to be aware of. Um, notice the referee's kind of stuck in the corner down there. She does a good job stepping out and circling the play, uh, so she doesn't get collected in the boards as well. All right, so we have one more board check that we'll see later on that's a lot of fun. Um, but um, all right, administering cards. Who, who did the last one? I don't remember where we were at. They did? All right, administering cards. So, yeah, so, so what cards do we have, and then how do you give it? So the yellows for like the board check, the sliding, and for those certain types. Typically, what does it mean to get a yellow card? Caution. Okay, caution. Accumulated too many fouls or one of those. Okay. And then the red's just uh, egregious, so you're out, you're gone. Right. Uh, can, is there a limit to how many yellow cards you can get? Two. Okay, two yellow cards, and then that turns into a red card. Um, and then how do you administer it? Uh, make sure the player knows you're getting it, be like assertive with it. Okay. Kind of don't get in their face. Yes. Yep. Um, so he pretty much nailed everything there. Um, yellow card, players showing a caution, they may remain in the game. Um, we don't force them to leave the court for a caution. Um, a second caution results in an ejection. They do have to leave, they have to meet with the supervisor. Um, red card, that's straight to an ejection. Uh, they, they have to leave the gym, they'll have to do a report with the supervisor before they leave. When he was talking about administering it, he said don't get in their face. If I come up to somebody, I'm only 5'6", I'm not very big, and I put a card straight out here, chances are I'm putting it in somebody's face. I don't want to put the card in somebody's face because they're going to get upset, more upset than they already are. Um, so I don't want to do anything to put myself in harm's way. So I'm going to keep a good distance between myself and them. I'm going to put the card up high where everybody can see it. So there's no mistaking that I'm giving this card to whoever I'm giving it to. I don't point at the players. I don't um, call them out. I typically, if they're walking away from me, I'll say 43, they turn around, they see the card, and then I write down what I need to write, and they go about their way. Most of the time they're not going to object with it. Most of the time they know if they're getting a card, they know they deserve it. Um, sometimes you will get the ones that think they did not do anything wrong and they'll want to argue it. Just kind of give them a, that's enough, I've given you the card, we're going to keep playing now, um, and, and then move on. Does anybody have any questions about administering cards? Your first one's always the hardest to give. If you've never given a card before, that's the hardest one to give. Your first ejection's harder than your first yellow card, but once you've given one of each, it, it just starts going at that point. You're like, oh, yep, that's a yellow card. That's a red card. And, and, and then you start giving out like candy, and then we gotta tell you to rein it in a little bit. But, uh, <laughs> um, okay, so no questions about cards. Cool. So like I said, we would see this, this play again. You'll see what color it is here in a second. Everybody see what color it was? <laughs> so, like I said, every once in a while you get a player who wants to explain why you are incorrect. He was not pleased with this decision. I will 100% support, support a red card here. Um, it's administered well, he knows who's getting it. He put it up for where everybody could see it and then he wanted to plead his case, but <laughs> does a, a good job just um, handling that, uh, his buddy who slide tackled earlier wants to come and talk about it as well. Um, but you see the other referee, that's Marissa. Uh, she does a good job walking over, just kind of getting the players away um, that might be coming in to join this discussion. Um, because I, I have no idea what he's doing. But 
So advantage versus anybody have any questions about that specific one? Okay. Advantage versus disadvantage. Advantage is when um, somebody follow your your teammate, but you can keep going with the ball. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So you can keep playing. Yeah, so pretty much. Yeah. Um, does advantage always have to be played, or is, that, is it at the discretion of the referee? The discretion of the referee. Okay, exactly. That's the big part. Um, and anything else with advantage, disadvantage? My part. Anybody else got anything? Okay. Um, a lot of words up here, but it's a discretionary call, like we said. Um, that's the biggest part with advantage. You don't have to award it. Players are going to say, but play the advantage. Maybe you should have, but it's at your discretion. So if it's at your discretion, the advantage is gone, then you can call the play back and give the original foul. So if a penalty is committed and the offended team still maintains an advantage, which can look in many different forms, um, then you'll allow the play to continue. Advantage can be they get fouled and the ball trickles to a teammate and that teammate's running towards the goal. That's an advantage. Play the advantage. It could be that their teammate picks up the ball from where they got fouled and makes a pass to an open player who's got a shot. That's an advantage. Play it. It could be the player gets fouled but continues to run through the tackle and they are going on, on to goal. Play the advantage. Let them go. Now, you give the play a few seconds to develop. Um, if nothing comes from it, then you can call that play back and give that original foul. Um, so. I see a player get tripped, I'm going to point at it, say advantage, play on, and then I'm going to see where the ball goes. The ball goes to a teammate. They start to dribble, but then they trip over their own foot and they fall. I'm not penalizing them because they're uncoordinated and this guy got fouled. So I'm going to call it back and I'm going to give the foul here. All right. So. It's something that you have to see a lot before you start to realize what you're, call what, what you're giving the advantage for and what you're, what you're not giving it for. Typically, what I like to do is it happens quick and in your head you're going to be like, you're going to miss it at one time. You're going to be like, oh, I could have given an advantage or I should have called that back. I typically do two dribbles or a pass or a shot. That typically tells me that they've gotten their advantage out of it. Not always. It's not a set in stone rule. But it's a, good, a pretty good one that I've used. Um, if a player gets two dribbles forward, then they're looking to do something with the ball. They've got an advantage out of that foul. If they've made a pass that progresses the play forward, then they've gotten an advantage from that. Now, if they just make a pass to the side and then that player loses it, that's not an advantage. I'm going to call that back. Um, but anytime they get a shot, the shot's going to be their advantage. That's, I'm going to be like, you got a shot out of that. That's, I gave you your advantage. I'm not giving you the foul now. Um, so if they try to let a shot go really fast so they can try to see if they can put it on goal and if they miss it, then they think they're going to get the foul, I'm not giving them that. All right. Um, the proper way to call an advantage is to yell advantage or play. I don't care what you do, um, but you just need to make sure you're loud so that all the players can hear you and know that you saw the foul that occurred and you're letting the play go. Um, and then you signal it um, to the players uh, so they know that it occurred. The way you signal advantage is you put your arms up in the air so everybody can see it. Some people put it down here. I don't like this because nobody can see that, especially if they're on the other side of the court and there's a bunch of players blocking them. So I put my arms up. Um, you look a little goofy when you're running like this, but it lets everybody know what's going on. Um, any questions about advantage, disadvantage? Graham? You guys give advantages if there's a PK? Um, generally, I mean, you can, um, but make sure it's a really good advantage because a lot of teams would rather have that penalty kick. Um, if it's not a clear cut goal scoring opportunity, I'm going to the PK. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Cool. All right. So some differences for our co-rec. Um, so, so Everything we've talked about rules-wise applies to Correct. Nothing changes there except for this. Um, so it's still played five on five. Uh, they've got to play with two males and two females, and the goalkeeper can be either gender. It doesn't matter. Um, the only time that changes is if they are at the minimum to start, which is four. Then they've got to have two goals and two females, and one of them must be the, be the goalkeeper. So they can have two males on the court and one female on the court, but that means there's got to be a, full, a female in the goal or vice versa. Um, so we changed this to an outdoor soccer, and this is not a change we made here. It is three on two or three and two, and the goalkeeper can be of either gender. So if they have three males on the on the 
but our non, uh, the non-goalkeeper, the female could be the goalkeeper. So we changed this in outdoor soccer this past year. So we're going to make that same change here to where they have to have three and two. Not three and one or four and one, it's three and two. And then the goalkeeper can be of any, anything. So ignore what I said then. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I looked at Danny, I was like, we changed this one, and I forgot to change it. <laughs> It's all right. So, what he said, three and two, goalkeeper can be either side. Um, substitutions can only be for the same gender. This helps the referees counting players coming on and off the court because it's on the fly, it happens fast. So making sure that a, a female runs off and a female comes on ensures you're maintaining that ratio of players. Um, if you get into the to a situation where you've got a, a male coming on and a female going off, and then three seconds later, you've got the, the opposite happening. You're trying to count and maintain balance, and you're missing what's happening with the actual play because play's not stopping. So just to keep things simple for the referees, it's got to be same gender substitutions. Um, and then penalty kicks must be taken by a person of the same gender who is fouled. Um, so if a female gets fouled, it's got to be a female that takes it. It doesn't have to be the same female that was fouled, though. Um, and same thing for the males. Any questions about correct? Um, handling, um, or handling conflict, I was thinking handball. Um, handling conflict, um, so first you want to know what the player's upset about. We saw the video just a second ago where the player got ejected and then wanted to plead his case. Clearly he was upset about being ejected. Um, so if they're mad about a call and they don't personally attack you, leave it alone. If you officiate soccer or officiate any sport, you're going to hear a lot of players say things like that's horrible or say they didn't like a call or something like that. But they're not attacking you or attacking your call. They're just upset with what you called. That's fine. They can be upset. They can have their own opinion about it. That doesn't bother me. What does bother me is if they start attacking you or using profane language. Um, that's when you've got to address it. Um, so you are horrible instead of that's horrible. I, I'm not accepting that. That's an attack on a referee. That's not, that's not being upset with a call. Um, are you effing kidding me? Um, again, not acceptable. And uh, you won't get this in soccer, but if it was basketball and somebody said ball doesn't lie, we're going to tee them up because we're not going to let them try to attack our call that way. Um, so luckily, that doesn't apply much to indoor soccer. If somebody tries to say that, then power to them. I don't know how they're going to pull that one off. But, um, and then the last one is baiting an opponent. Uh, we have a zero uh, tolerance policy for taunting, so that goes to baiting. Um, so you have to address that quickly. So any kind of trash talk or taunting that they want to do directly at an opponent, we're going to nip right away so that it doesn't escalate from there. So those are what yellow is in from the middle down? Um, is, it, is it just like you tell them to stop? So depending on the severity, uh, these can definitely be red. This is definitely red. Um, but if you can talk to them and talk them out of a red card, then try to do that. Um, so if it's, they've been fine all game long and then they just got really upset this one time, just try to talk to them and calm them down, get them out of that red card situation. Now if they keep going, then we, we can send them because we don't pay you enough to deal with getting badgered like that all game long. So we're not going to make you put up with that. Questions about that? What if someone tells you that someone's baiting them? Like if another player that comes to, comes to the ref and is like other players saying this about me? So one, props to that player because a lot of players would just slug them. Um, and two, um, tell them, okay, I'm going to listen for it. And then try to get yourself in a position where you can hear that player. Um, so if, whether it's coming from the bench or coming from a player on the court, just kind of make a note of it and try to get yourself in a position where you can hear that. That way, if it continues to happen, you can step in and address it. That's a good question. Anything else? Questions? Cool. Um, so these are our steps in handling conflict. Uh, this is kind of our progression ladder for, for how you'll go about it. So we start with the quiet word. Um, this can get you a long way with a lot of players. Uh, so this is just a one-on-one -on -one conversation where only you and the other player hear the conversation. So if somebody misses a shot, goes way up in the net, and there was, the goalie was out of goal. They should have scored. They get upset with themselves. They curse under their breath, but you hear it. They run past you, you kind of pull them to the side, you say, hey, I know you're frustrated, but watch your language for me. They'll say, oh, my bad, my bad. And then hopefully they'll watch the language. You don't have to take any additional action with them. Um, players are appreciative when you do this with them because it keeps them from getting any trouble that they don't really need to be in. Um, so use this one when you can. It's not always gonna work, but it helps you build your rapport with the players. Um, 
a public warning. So if one player, we saw um, we saw the player earlier that uh, slid tack slide tackled that player uh, right against the boards. Chances are he's been pro causing problems all game long if he's doing something like that. So you can use a public warning to try to get to, through to him to stop. At that point, everybody knows you've had enough of what he's doing and he needs to stop um, or, or there's going to be consequences coming. Um, so do it loud enough where everybody hears it. You're putting that one player on blast in front of everybody else and you're saying that's enough, I've had enough of that. And they're going to hopefully at that point cut it out. If they don't, we have additional tools that we can use with our cards. Um, your captain's meeting, do this early, not late. If you let stuff go all game long and then with two minutes to go in a 4-4 game on championship night, you try to pull the captains together and say, so this has gotten really aggressive. I need you guys to kind of calm down for me a little bit. They are not going to calm down at that point in time. So use this early to try to get through to the captains. If you do this early and it's still not working, then we can go to our cards. Um, there, there's no issue with doing that. Um, but just don't save your captain's meeting until the end of the game and don't make it something you're doing religiously every single game. Um, it, it, should, it should be a once in a, in a blue moon tool that you have to go to, but um, every once in a while, um, especially if you're officiating our Greek teams, their captains or the presidents, whoever's putting together their teams, will be willing to help you out um, so that their teams don't get any, in any additional trouble. Um, yellow card. It's part of your toolbox, so make sure you use it. We talked about it. Um, it. You have it. We don't track them, so there's no accumulation penalty for players, necessarily. Um, we don't tell them that. Um, but you can use it as you need to. Um, your ejection or your red card, it's your last resort, but if someone crosses the line, we've got to get them out. Um, intramurals is supposed to be son a fun, safe, inviting, and inviting uh, place for people to come. We don't want anybody who goes against those things participating. Um, so. The biggest thing is don't make threats with players. So if you say one more word and you're gone, the player's going to say word, and then you've got to eject them for saying word. And you don't want to have to do that. So don't make threats. And when you draw your line, make sure it's in concrete. Don't keep moving it. If you draw it in sand, the, you can wipe that away and you can back it up. So make sure that whenever you're, you're setting your boundary, that's it. And if they cross it, you're ready to take action. Any questions about that? Does the captain's mean like a timeout? Um, so in indoor soccer, great question because clock runs continuously. Um, yeah, so we'll stop the clock. Referees will say, I need to see both captains. Bring the captains out. If they're on the court, and bring them over to you. If they're on the bench, say, I want you out here. And then you'll talk to them and tell them you've had enough of whatever it is, physicality, the, the talk, whatever it's going on. Um, if teams are talking too much, we'll say you got uh, yellow and green. So you'll look at yellow captain and you'll say, yellow, I want yellow to talk to yellow. I want green to talk to green. I don't want any more. And hopefully they clean that up. Um, so. That's a good question. Anything it's else? It's also different than the pre-game captain meeting that you have. Yeah. It's kind of set the tone before you go in. Yeah, if you're at this point, you, the captains are not in good graces currently, and you need them to get back in good graces. Pre-game, you're building that rapport with your team. Here, you're telling them, I need you to clean this up right now. OK? Um, so sportsmanship, it's on a scale of 1 to 5. Uh, 5 being the best, 1 being the worst. Every game you do you'll put a sportsmanship rating on the teams that you officiate. It's important because any team that is below a three for their sportsmanship rating at the end of the season cannot go to playoffs. So we do track sportsmanship. It is important. And uh, the teams, whether they realize it or not at, in the moment, um, are going to want to have at least a three rating from each game they play. Um, this should be done right after the game. Your supervisor should come find you um, to get your, sport, your sportsmanship rating for the teams. If not, go find them to give them it. Um, these are what they are. Um, the biggest thing to note is that if you give a two, we need it to be documented. So you'll have to fill out an incident report um, that explains why you gave those teams a two rating. Like I said, very important because we base playoffs off of our team sportsmanship. So. If you're going to give it two, that's OK. They might deserve it, but we need, it, we need your, your reasoning so that we can support it. Um, you won't give a lot of ones. Hopefully, you don't have to give any ones. Um, but if you do, it, it says right there, you also need documentation. Uh, that's when the team is completely out of control. You've tried giving cards. You've ejected players, and nothing is, is getting them back under control. So. Uh, most, most of the time, you'll have a, have a three or a four is what your sportsmanship rating will be. All right, two-person mechanics. Um, 
Is everybody good? Does anybody need a bathroom break? Water break? Good to keep going? Yeah. All right. So two-person mechanics. Uh, so the way we officiate on the court, we don't have three officials out there. The court's way too small for that. We do two. Um, lead and a trail. You will be both so that you're not lead all night, you're not trail all night. It changes throughout the game constantly. Um, so the lead is whichever referee is ahead of the play. Uh, they're responsible for the sideline and the end line. Um, so try to picture it. We've got diagrams that we'll go over here in a second. Um, but they're the one primarily responsible for deciding if a goal counts. So it's different than outdoor because you don't have an end line that you're getting to. And once you get down in the corner, you feel trapped. So you don't want to get all the way down there, but you want to be able to be able to see if the ball has gone in the goal. Um, so, and they're also responsible for penalties inside the box. Um, the trail, they're trailing the play. They're catching action behind the ball. Um, they're responsible for the other sideline and the opposite end line. And the trail is the one who starts all kickoffs with the whistle. So the trail will make sure that the scorekeeper is ready to go, make sure the other referee is ready to go, and they'll be the one that starts the play and starts the game. Okay? So the ball is going towards that end of the room. That means the lead is the, uh, the, the referee on the top, trail's on the bottom, and the trail will start the, start the kickoff with a whistle. We don't have a diagram of our Mac gym, so it's a soccer field, but our, our courts don't look like this, obviously. Um, so this is their coverage. So the lead has the sideline against their back, the, and, and the end line, and the penalty box. Trail has everything back behind the play. Um, so this is why I was talking about earlier, helping your partner out on balls that go straight up in the air. The lead can't see that teal line because his back, his or her back is right up against that wall. So they can't look up and see it and also see where the ball is. So that's where the trail is going to help them out in this case or this situation and call that looking across the court. Um, it could be reversed depending on, on which side it is. This could be the lead down here helping out the trail. Um, but just kind of give you a picture of what that looks like. Uh, goal kick. So we do have goal kicks in indoor soccer, just like outdoor soccer. Uh, they have to come out. Trail has the responsibility here because the ball's going that way. Lead's got everything up there. The lead is, uh, is ready for anything going towards the goal. Uh, goal kicks break fast in indoor soccer, so uh, be ready to, to run with them um, as it goes down the court. Corner kicks, you'll notice that the ball is not in the corner for the corner kick. That's because our corner kicks come out to the 28 foot mark for the high school basketball benches. Um, we'll show you where that mark is on the court, but it's about where it is on this diagram here. They'll play it into the box from there, um, but that just keeps the ball from getting down in the corner uh, uh, for the corner kick. Um, the trail, probably not coming down all the way into here. This is set up more for an outdoor soccer corner kick. You probably want to hang out around midcourt. Um, and then the lead, uh, I would be on the other side of that ball for the kick. Um, but you've still got all of that responsibility down there. Um, and, and both of you can be looking into the box for any penalties happening um, during corner kick. Uh, penalty kick set up pretty much exactly like this for indoor just like outdoor. Um, the lead's got the goalie and making sure the ball goes in the goal. Um, and making sure the goalie doesn't come off their line. The trail has making sh is making sure that nobody infringes on the, on, the, on the restricted area. And also the trail is starting the penalty kick with the whistle. Throw-ins, we don't have throw-ins, but they put the ball down and kick it in. But the setup's the same. Um, it's basically the same coverage that, they, that they've normally got during the flow of play. So this one should move. So you can see how it moves. Ball goes forward, then it comes back, the trail becomes the lead, and then the lead becomes the trail and follows the play up. So this is good positioning. That's Jake down in the corner there. He's going to see the ball coming, steps into the court. So notice how he's not got himself stuck to the wall. You don't want to be stuck to the wall because if you're stuck to the wall, you're going to get hit a lot with the ball. Um, so he steps in, lets the play go by, circles around it. Um, and if the volume was on, you'd hear him play an advantage right here at the end right here. Um, but I, I don't have the volume on. So it's good officiating there. This is not so good positioning. He's stuck to the wall, gets hit once, gets hit twice, still stuck to the wall. Um, so you're going to get hit. Indoor soccer is fast. There's no way to not get hit. Um, it doesn't matter how long you officiate and how good your movement and your positioning is. There's 
ricochets and bounces that you just can't predict and you're gonna get hit. It doesn't hurt, it's a foam ball. Um, but try to avoid getting hit as much as possible. Um, so the, uh, the best way to do this is you notice the ball is going down in the corner. They're gonna wanna play the ball off the wall to get it back up. Step off the wall and give them that avenue to do it. Because um, you can anticipate that coming. And the biggest part about officiating indoor soccer is your anticipation. You're gonna be able to anticipate a lot, but you can tell that they wanna go into the corner there and he didn't give them the avenue to do it. And then you can tell they wanna come back up the wall and once again, didn't have the avenue to do it. So just try to help yourself out and get out of those situations. Any questions about positioning? One of the things I will add is what I don't want you to do is be like, I'm a hockey linesman, and then jump up on the boards. Because now you're stuck on the boards, and guess what? If somebody hits you, the ball hits you, you're in a bad position. If you're on the glass side, and you try to jump up on the boards, and somebody hits you and knocks you into the glass, we're in even more, more trouble. So do not be like a hockey linesman and jump up. I have no problem you stepping over the ball and jumping over the ball, but I don't want you to sit up on the boards. That's not what we need to do. All right, so upcoming training dates we talked about at the beginning of training. Um, Tuesday, tomorrow, uh, we will do more training here in the building. We'll be down on the court for a little bit. They've got court four. Uh, they've got basketball in the on court five and six, so we won't get to get in the MAC gym tomorrow night, but we will be on court four to do some mechanic stuff. Some of the supervisors that I showed you all earlier will be coming in to do that, that, uh, those stations with you. Um, and then Monday, March 23rd, will be our practice games. So you'll pick a time for those signups. We'll take care of that as we get closer to that, though. Um.